When we learn about how the British introduced the English language into India, it leads us to question the Indian education system of today. What were the reasons for the introduction of English-speaking colleges and curriculums? Was the English language a tool of oppression, or did it enable social mobility and job opportunities? Does it bear any benefits today? Let's find out. Before British intervention, Hindus and Muslims were educated separately in places of worship while private tutors taught the very rich. In 1813, the Charter Act made the East India Company responsible for the education of all Indian. In 1835, Thomas Babington Macaulay made his famous minute on education, suggesting that an English education was more important than learning Sanskrit or Arabic. This led to the establishment of English colleges, including those specialising in medicine. Fast forward to the 1960s, and 30 to 40% of all junior doctors in the UK were from Sri Lanka, Bangladesh or India. Let's jump into our roundtable discussion and find out more. Today we are here to discuss Thomas Babington Macaulay and his impact on the education system in India and how that has reverberated over the past centuries to the state of India today. And let's not forget that in 1813 a Charter Act was passed that actually put the education of, of all Indians into the East India Company's hand. It established three, three main things. The study of science and maths was prioritised over religion. Educational books were not printed in native Indian languages. English became the main language taught in schools. How did English get to the point where it is now a commonly uh, spoken language in India? And a highly valued language as Incredibly. well. Incredibly. This ties in with every other uh, pro-Raj conversation <laughs> that's ever brought up ever. That there's somehow uh, a civilization that the West possesses that that great great Britain possesses that no other nation uh, possesses which I find hi highly offensive mm -hmm. uh, and the Commonwealth is essentially built on that right mm -hmm. um, hello we're Great Britain uh, we rock up do you have you heard of us no we, we don't even know who you are we're quite happy here doing what we do uh, no no you must learn about us so let's translate all of our books and all the things that we that we've written about ourselves and let's just put them into your language so you can learn, so we can indoctrinate you through your education system. But that's, that's an imperialist that attitude that you see in a lot of other countries doing. So you see it with mm. the Spanish and the Portuguese when they go into South America. Mm. You see it with the French as they go into the Polynesian islands. Essentially you had this hierarchy so if you were Indian and you were able to um, go to in, go to Britain if you could afford it then you were able to get that elite education which then put you amongst the elite of Indian society but at the same time there was a glass ceiling because ultimately you had Brits right at the top yeah. and that th there's still a kind of contemporary legacy there if you look at the state of Indian education in the pre-colonial period um, you have forms of education at all levels of Indian society mm -hmm. down to the village level mm -hmm. various forms of native education that catered to various needs mm -hmm. so you had kind of the vocational you have the spiritual and also the religious mm -hmm. as the, the british secured their power uh, through conquest and all the things that go along with conquest plundering looting you essentially have a disruption of is the established economies um, fiscal arrangements which had a direct impact on indigenous forms of learning and education because yeah. it's a little bit like central government taking over all the council's education budgets now and people from Eton deciding how people from Tower Hamlets are going to be educated yeah. Yeah. that's what it feels like especially the idea of India as a Hindu nation you know, India mm. is so diverse and so many minorities get missed out on the agenda because India is marketed as this Hindu country. In, in 1965, the English Language Amendment Bill was passed precisely because non-Hindi speaking states refused to accept Hindi as a sole language after mm. partition and independence. And so English was declared an associate language so it could be taught alongside you know, the other languages. And, mm. and it remains the case today that English and Hindi are the, the two official languages of India's government. Yeah. Um, and English is the only official language of, of India's Supreme Court. Because it was almost like a unifying, we can't yeah. satisfy everyone's needs. English is a way in which we can 
Mm. Keep people happy by not exacerbating regional or religious tension by enforcing Hindi. Dr. Zahir Masani has written an autobiography on Macaulay, calling him Britain's liberal imperialist. And um, he, he notes that Macaulay inspired hostility as well as admiration. Um, but he does credit him with um, correctly predicting that the English language held the key to success in a globalised knowledge economy. And if we put that into the context, in particular with Britain at this time, you've got the Industrial Revolution, um, you've got production of a lot of textiles and raw materials being taken out of India back into England because it suddenly becomes cheaper to produce them in England rather than export them from India. Do we think that he's worthy of that, that credit? Because he, he correctly envisaged that in 50, 75, 100 years time, the majority language in the world would be English. Well, I think it's actually Chinese, but... The problem is the degrading of native culture and native languages as well, and like putting them a second best to English is that hierarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's pro problematic. It's, and, and it's understandable in retrospect when you think about what they're trying to do. You know, you want to first of all understand what the hell they're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, and so that if you can understand what they're talking about, you can partake in that conversation and then eventually overrule and overtake the conversation to have a conversation that you really want to have. And the second point being, if you are going to be able to um, rule any country, then control through language is the only way to do it. So can we say then that to some extent the introduction of English within the educational system has, has produced this sort of new class, like an, perhaps an unexpected output of, of the Educational Act was that you have this intermediary class of, of Indian citizens who are seen as being different because of their English capabilities. It's no longer about English being oppressive, it's about English being an aspiration. Like it's a way out mm. of poverty, That's it's a way appealing. of making a different life. Absolutely, yeah. It's one of the reasons why I'm here today in, in, in Leicester. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think there is a, a danger in um, trying to um, come to a solution by way of trying to preserve something. Yeah, it's not. And then you kind of end up trying to preserve this kind of fossilized becomes dead language. language. Yeah, yeah. language yeah. is not. And it has to be, like you said, dynamic. It has to incorporate popular culture and change. Yeah. Should we be saying these were great languages that served a purpose at a particular point in time in history, but we now acknowledge them as being no longer relevant, just to play devil's advocate. I don't think it's anything to do with the language, as you anointed to earlier. I think the language is absolutely innocent. And I think once we establish that what the intention behind education is supposed to be, really I think it's about accepting that evolution happens, knowing what we know about the human condition, and um, allowing things to evolve organically, but also creating room for good intentions. I think knowledge was always in India received more than just academic, it was always mm. spiritual as well. Mm. And I think that can heal the world given the current state of war a minute. I think the world needs that.